scientists are not eliminating God. They are eliminating models of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. The Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after the identified that the females. According to the statute of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I have been raped in U.S. the time I am here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. To give, it's time to live honestly with no pretense. It's time to share, it's time to care about every move you make. It's time to share and to declare the hope of my heart won't break. It will never. Shri Krishna tells Arjun that, O oh Arjun, rise and fight. If you are killed, you will go to Swarg, heavenly planets. If you come back alive, you would get the wealth of this world. It is the verbatim translation of Sai Bukhari, volume 4, Hadith number 46. So when these critics of Islam, especially the Hindus, like Arun Shuri, I wondered that they haven't read the old scriptures and they're pointing all in the Quran. The moment you give the context and speak to them, the complete misconception is washed away. Come to common terms as we ascend you. So it's the duty of every Muslim that he conveys the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Dawa is fard. But unfortunately today, we Muslims, we give excuses for not doing the job. When we tell them, why don't you do dawah? They say, inshallah, when we get the knowledge, we start doing dawah. The time will never come. If you think you'll wait till you become like Sheikh Dida, and then start doing dawah, the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sai Bukhari, Balli go of ayah. Propagate even if you know one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, you have to do your job. At least the Muslims know there is one God. At least tell that. You know about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger. He's the last and final message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. At least tell that. If they ask you the question, how do you prove it? If you don't know, come back and do your homework. I have given the talk on is the Quran God for proving the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have given the talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures. Come home and do your homework. In this way, inshallah, Allah will help you and you will be able to convey the message of Islam. Some Muslims come and tell me, the brother Zakir, first we want to make the Musalman pakka Musalman. We want to make the Muslims practicing Muslims and then we'll do dawah to the non-Muslims. I say the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself could not convince his own uncle. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? In the farewell pilgrimage, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Sahabas, there were 110,000 Sahabas, that did I deliver the message to you? And all of them said, Beishak, yes, verily you have done it. The Prophet told them that all those who are present here, deliver the message to those who are not present here. And out of 110,000 Sahaba, more than 100,000 Sahabas, they were buried outside the Arab land. Doing what? Making Muslim pakka Muslim, making Muslims practice Muslims. They went to do Dawah. In Medina, 
There were Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation salah, did not come for the Juma salah. The Prophet said he felt like burning their homes. Yet, he sent messengers to the king of Abyssinia, king of Persia, king of Yemen, asking them to accept Islam. He did not say, first I'll make all the Muslim, 100% practicing Muslim, and then do da'wah. Doing da'wah is part on every Muslim. It's compulsory. But many of the Muslims tell me that when we start doing da'wah to the non-Muslims, they tell us to mind your own business. I tell them, if any non-Muslim tells me to mind my business, I will say, that's what I'm doing. It's the duty of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. So by doing da'wah, I'm minding my business. That is my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. It is fard on every Muslim to convey the message of Islam. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal Asr. By the token of time, man is well in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, Righteous deeds, dawa, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering five times salah, you may have gone for hajj, but if you don't do dawa, you shall not enter Jannah. Only dawa is also not sufficient. All four are equally important Iman, righteous deeds, dawa, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If you do not do dawa under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's his business. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 116 and verse number 48, that Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive you. So if you don't do dawa and Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. But under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawa, you shall not enter Jannah. And especially to those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. It's an awwal fard. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in no less than three different places, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says, Huwa allazi arsala rasul hu bil huda wa al-deen al-haq liu zhirau al-deen kulli wa la qaril mushrikoon. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be Christianism, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Buddhism, whether it be communism, whether it be atheism, Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulli, master them all. How much the mushrik don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that his deen will prevail will supersede all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah himself is sufficient to make his deen prevail. He does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and to earn a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, which says, Woman has to call a mimman doil a lohi, who amil a soli home, who call a Indian Muslim. 
Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness and says that I'm a Muslim? Jazakallah khair. I hope, inshallah, that we will benefit from the words and advice of our brother, Dr. Zakir Naik, inshallah. Time is ticking on, and I would like to immediately go into the question and answer session. I would like to lay out the ground rules for this part of the program, inshallah. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general question on religion, will not be permitted. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you'll have to go at the end of the queue and await your second chance to ask a question. Non-Muslim brothers and sisters will be given first preference to ask questions. Two mics have been provided in the auditorium. I believe there is one here to the left, there's one here to the right, the format will be that the sisters will use the mic to my left and the brothers will use the mic to the right. We will allow one question at each of the mics in clockwise rotation, written questions on slips of papers available to with our volunteers on the sides and in the central aisles will be given secondary preference after Dr. Thakur Naik finishes answering the questions asked on the mic and only if time permits. So kindly state your name and your profession before putting forth your question. I would like to ask you, those brothers to, uh, and sisters to ask who wish to ask questions to form an orderly queue and we will commence in just a few moments, inshallah. Are there any non-Muslims in our audience who would like to ask questions? Please come forward. The mic is free and we will give the non-Muslims preference, inshallah. Good evening and salam alaikum to everyone. I'm uh, Councillor Navin Shah, leader of Hero Council. I'd like to uh, give a very warm welcome to Zakir Bhai on behalf of Hero Council and multicultural, multi-faith community of Hero. You are very, very welcome. Since I'm limited to one question, I will follow the discipline. It's been very thought-provocating address. I'm very grateful for that. You have analyzed to some degree of detail various religions, the Islam, the Hinduism, Judaism, and even atheists. Is it a question of equality of religions? Or do you reckon that there is a case for supremacy of one religion against another. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question. That is there a question of supremacy of one religion over the other religion? Basically, what is the meaning of the word religion? Religion means a way of life. I rather believe what the Quran says. Rather than talking about supremacy, the Quran says, Come to common terms as been us and you. If there is a question of supremacy, 
then each one will try and prove that religion is the best. So rather the Quran advises when we speak with people following other religion, is Come to common terms has been assigned you. So I personally disagree with the interfaith dialogues that take place normally in the world. Normally what happens is that there is a person coming from the Christian faith, priest, and coming that all religions are the same, Christianity is the same, Hinduism is the same, Islam is the same. Then you have a Hindu Pandit coming and saying Hinduism is also correct and same, Islam is the same, Christianity is the same. Then they get Joker Muslim who comes and says that Islam is the same, Hinduism is the same, Christianity is the same. See, I being a student of Islam and compared religion, it's a big lie to say that all religions are the same. There are commonalities, but they aren't the same. There are differences. I can talk more about differences than the similarities, but the Quran encourages to talk about similarities. What my strategy is, brother, that I tell that at least let us agree that one religious scripture is 100% perfect. So the Christian will say, fine, I don't mind believing that Bible is 100% the word of God. The Hindu would say, I would not mind believing the Vedas to be the word of God. The Muslim will say, I don't mind considering Quran to be the word of God. I am not trying to put anything on the top of somebody's head, not going to put anything down the throat. Now what I say, that what is common in all these scriptures, at least let us agree to follow that strictly. What is different, we'll discuss it later on. So when we come and try and find the commonalities in all the scriptures, we find that the commonality is the same. All of the religious scriptures say believe in one God. I gave you references from the Bible. Bible Moses, peace be upon him, said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4, Shama Israelo, Adne Hinot Nechad. Your Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon us, asked that which is the first of the commandment, he repeated verbatim the same thing in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adnan Hainu Adnai Khad, which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. If we read the Hindu scriptures, if we read the Upanishads, it's mentioned in the Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, Verse number one, ekam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shweta Shatar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Nacha sikasij janita nachadipa, which means of that God, he has got no superior, he has no lord, he has got no parents, he has got no mother, he has got no father, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in Shweta Shatar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Of him, there is no images. I can give quotations from Bhagavad Gita, Upanishad, Veda, several, talking about oneness of God. So I say that why don't all of us believe in one God? Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 20 says that all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods, they do idol worship. So if you read the Vedas and Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, they say there is one God. It's against idol worship. They don't believe in Almighty God coming down. They believe in Almighty God sending messengers. So I say that let us, the Hindus, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, at least believe that we worship none but one Almighty God. And that God has got no images. He cannot be begotten. It's mentioned in the Bible, it's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, it's mentioned in the Quran. If you studied all these scriptures, the next point you come to know which is common is that there's going to come a final and last messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I give you quotations in my lecture about Judaism and Christianity, I can give you references even from the Hindu scriptures. If you Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adhetri, Shlokas 10 to 27, 
इट स्पीक्स अबाउट मोहम्मद यू स्पीक अबाउट कुंट सुक्ताज अथर्वा वेद बुक नंबर ट्वेंटी हिम नंबर वन ट्वेंटी सेवन वर्स नंबर वन टू फोर्टीन स्पीक अबाउट मोहम्मद देर इज अ बुक कॉल एस कल की पुराना इट स्पीक्स अबाउट एन अवतार कल की अवतार टू कम इट्स मेन्शन दिंदू स्क्रिप्चर इन कल की पुराना that there is a final avatar antim rishi last messenger going to come whose mother's name shall be sumati which means peaceful which means amina it says the father's name shall be a one who worships almighty god vishnu yash translate to arabic it means abdullah the name of the parents of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it says that he will be born on the 12th month of madhav which is 12th rabi awwal It says that he will be the last and final messenger. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, last and final messenger. It says that he will be held with four companions, talking about the first four caliphs of Islam, and on and on. He will be born in the place which is known as peaceful, Sambhala, which is Makkah. He will be born in the family of the chief of Makkah. I have given the talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hindu scriptures. So, second point of commonality is according to me. after being in one god we have to follow the last and final messenger to come that is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it speaks about life after death the jewish scriptures christian scriptures hindu scriptures and islam when hindu scripture speaks about punar janam it speaks about next life it doesn't speak about life death life death that's a misconception punar means next Janam means life. We believe in life after death, but not being born and death, born, dying, born, dying. That's a misconception. So what I say, at least let us agree what is common. So all the major religious scriptures, whether it be Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, speak about one God and speak about the final messenger to come, whose name shall be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if all of them follow the last and final messenger they have to follow the revelation given them have to follow the Quran so rather than talking about supremacy we have to go back there's only one religion and the one religion as Allah says in the Quran in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 19 in nadina in the la ilaha islam the only religion acceptable in the sight of almighty god is submitting your will to almighty god islam submitting your will to almighty god it's not a label a person by keeping his name muhammad sultan abdullah zakir he will not go to heaven just by having a muslim name muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to almighty god so all the religious scriptures that came previously brother by the passage of time they have been changed quran is the last and final revelation which has been kept in its pure form but in spite when all the other scriptures have been changed according to the scholars you read the books of hindu scholars of christian scholars they say the scriptures have been changed but even after they have been changed there are remnants of truth in them we speak about the last and final messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and talking about one god so if we go back to your scriptures and at least follow the commonalities that nothing like supremacy will culminate only to one religion that is submitting our will to almighty god hope that answers the question can i ask if there are any sisters who are non muslims who would like to ask a question first on the sister side is any non muslim sister which is to ask a question good evening dr naik my question to you this evening is with all due respect to islam you said that idol worship is the greatest sin in islam and allah does not forgive an idol worshipper for this But what about people who have been born into families of religions other than Islam? For example, in India, most of the population is Hindu, and lifelong they may not have had exposure to Islam, 
or somebody else who may have educated them about that. What is the fault of those people? Will they never reach paradise? Will Allah never let these people enter paradise? What is their fault if they believe what is being taught to them since the day they were born? Does Allah not have mercy on them? Thank you. Sister Dawson, very good question, very logical question. What about those human beings who are born in non-Muslim families and the parents are doing idol worship? Who's to blame? How can Allah punish them? And that's a very good question. That's the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. Every child is born as a Muslim. Irrespective of whether he's born in